Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar, and thank you all for joining us. Today, Positive Luxury's co-founder and CEO, Diana Verdenieto, will be in conversation with Ray Newton-Smith, Chief Economist at the CBI, or Confederation of British Industry. Rain is an expert on macroeconomic forecasts, as well as economic stability and international trade. At the CBI, Rain and her team work to formulate advice for business leaders on the economic outlook in the UK, as well as global risks. In this webinar, she will be discussing how businesses can navigate through the pandemic and what to expect when emerging from it. We'll have 10 minutes at the end um, of the talk. Uh, to answer the questions, so please submit them uh, through the Q&A box uh, so Diana and Rain can answer them at the end. Over to you, Diana. Thank you so much, Claudia, and good morning, everyone. I have an incredible pleasure to be here with Rain Newton smith um, Rain, good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to be here with us today. And... Um, I'd love to start by asking you the questions that you've probably been asked a hundred times, um, which is, you know, what industry do you think uh, we will recover faster from the pandemic? And also, you know, kind of how can companies navigate the access to funding, big and small companies? And of course, you know, kind of um, how businesses, well, in general, can navigate through through this. Um, like Claudia said, uh, please, everybody, uh, submit your Q and A. So uh, about uh, ten twenty, um, Rain will start answering them. And also, um, just to let you know, uh, our website still on maintenance this morning, <laughs> as you do. Uh, so uh, please follow us on Instagram. And this afternoon we will posting we will be posting a summary of uh, the webinar. So thank you very much, and over to you, Rain. Thank you. Um, well, thanks very much, uh, Diana. And and just to say, look, I think it's amazing what. Uh, what you've done with positive luxury and, and, and what an advocate and champion you are for a sustainable business. I, I know it's it's a really difficult time for small businesses, for startups um, uh, and for everyone really, uh, but but so important to, to have you as a, a source of, of information. Um, probably what's helpful is if I sort of set out a little bit you know, what the role of the CBI is, what we've been doing, um, how we work, and, and I think importantly, what, how we've sort of seen our role um, as this crisis has unfolded. Um, and then give you a, a bit of a sense of, of, you know, how we're seeing the economic outlook. Look, it, uh, I don't, I, I almost, I don't really think you can do forecasts or anything at, at the moment, but just sort of help maybe think through some of the things that, that people are saying and how this might play out in the short term, but over, over the longer term. Um, but then I think also importantly, uh, talk through some of the support that the government has put uh, in place to sort of help everyone through this crisis. And, you know, I'm, I'm really interested to, to hear what people's questions are and, and what your experiences are as well. Um, so do you share that? Um, uh, so look, um, the, you know, the CBI, so we represent businesses of all shapes and sizes uh, around the UK. Um, uh, and we also do have some small offices in China, uh, in the US um, and in Brussels and, and Delhi as well. Um, and I think actually having some of that international experience has been quite helpful in navigating where we are because this is, you know, certainly a sort of global crisis. And, um, and I think um, particularly as this crisis has unfolded, we've seen it as really important for us to play that role uh, explaining what's happening and really helping as many businesses through this. So um, if you do want sort of more information, if you go to our website as well, um, you can find we have a whole hub around coronavirus and a lot of links to the government support. Um, but we can maybe pick up some of that um, uh, in, uh, you know, sort of in questions. So look, um, I mean, I think the scale of what we're seeing is, you know, is truly un unprecedented. You know, I was an economist working at the Bank of England when uh, we saw the first bank failure in over a hundred years when Northern Rock went under during the global, which then, you know, was one of the milestones really in the global financial crisis. Um, but I think what is unfolding now is, um, well, it's different. I think it will be more severe in the short term, but actually I think we should see economies around the world recover more quickly 
from this uh, in a way than we did after the global financial crisis. Um, but the, you know, the, the challenge at the moment is you've probably got over 70% of the world economy who is in some form of lockdown uh, at the moment. Um, and, and that means you know, economic activity has sort of ground to the halt. Um, you've seen all you know, financial markets have been huge volatility. We saw oil prices go negative uh, earlier this week. That was something I never thought we'd see in, in my lifetime. And that was you know, really around, um, you know, because demand has just sort of fallen through uh, the floor. Um, and I mean, I think one of the sort of positive things I would say from it is because you are seeing such rapid change in, in the world and um, it does mean that it, it allows us to kind of rethink some of the policies. So look, oil prices sort of falling through uh, the floor. On the one hand, you think, well, maybe this will be bad for uh, the environment because oil will be too cheap and, and um, won't sort of face the true carbon price. Um, but I think one of the things the crisis has really made apparent to everyone is just how important the environment is to everyone. Uh, you know, it won't have escaped everyone's notice that air pollution is a lot lower. There are, you know, we've got clean skies. And I'm not saying that we would ever want to be experiencing what is a very brutal, um, uh, you know, and challenging time for everyone to make that transition to low carbon economy. But it shows you some of the benefits if we can get our energy mix right and actually having oil prices super low is is can be an opportunity uh for us to look at carbon pricing again and um i think as we recover from this one of the things that's you know i was certainly working on a lot before the crisis unfolded was that move to a low carbon uh, economy and the good news is lots of people are still really thinking on about that and focused on it um but look from what we're seeing in terms of the data from the businesses that i've been speaking to I think the forecast about how, you know, in this quarter in the UK, I think we will see the Office for Budget Responsibility. That is the institute who do the forecast uh, for the government, for their fiscal uh, position. They set out a scenario where GDP fell by 35%. I know that sounds terrifying uh, in Q2, but they then saw quite a, a strong uh, recovery after that. And I think most forecasters as a whole are sort of looking at growth in the UK for this year, contracting by about 6%, um, but then recovering next year to, to grow by around 5%. Look, there's huge uncertainty about that. It really depends how we tackle this health crisis. It depends, of course, about how we reopen the economy. And of course, the thing that people are worried about is not just the rate of infections now, but whether we get any sort of echo uh, infections later in the year and I think there's you know concerns about what might happen in the autumn uh, which is something that I think people have um, definitely have their eyes on um, so my sense is we will see we will see sort of you know very sharp dip uh, in the economy but then it will gradually recover I've uh, I, I can sort of call it a Nike swoosh um, I feel like I have to say other trainers are available um, when I say that. Um, but I think the extent of that, both the downturn and how we recover will, will depend on, on three really important things. One, it's absolutely about how we all behave. You know, how do we come out of this crisis? Because we know from what the Office for National Statistics have set out is about three quarters of households have seen their income, their household income uh, has already lowered as a result of this crisis. Um, uh, but what we don't know is how people will feel as we start to come out of this, as we start to, re you know, I think we are going to be living with some form of social distancing for a while, but, but it, you know, people are already thinking about opening up the economy, about the return to work across different sectors. And as we come out of the very strict uh, lockdown, you know, how will we behave? Will we, will we be so excited to see people, to travel? Uh, to go to restaurants, if you know, and and to take advantage of all those sorts of opportunities, and uh, we think, you know, actually this has shown us life is too short. We need to focus on the things that matter to us. Or will people come out of this feeling scared? Will they, you know, will they be worried about their job? Will they be worried about, you know, the outlook in the economy? Will they? Will that sense of insecurity mean that people are cautious, that they save, that they don't want to go out and you know, I think that's a big question. And, and of course, 
and we'll maybe come on to discuss this later, there are much you know, bigger questions about what it means to our lifestyle, how we va value family, how we value working from home, how, do, how does it sort of change our worldview? But I think in the short term, it will be that, you know, how do we spend when we come out of this will be one of the big determining factors. The second is absolutely about, um, you know, unemployment and businesses, how many jobs are lost as we go through this crisis um, and what happens with business? Do we lose a lot of businesses as we go through this crisis? And that has absolutely been the focus of government policy. Um, I've been, uh, hopefully most of you know about the job retention scheme. That's the policy that's been put in place uh, by the Treasury and by HMRC uh, to protect people's jobs. So if you are a, a business who's been severely impacted uh, by the virus um, and the social distancing that's been put in place, so you could be a hotel uh, who's had to close your doors or a retailer, um, uh, a non-essential retailer, or there are so many businesses that have been impacted. Um, so you're, you're faced with the situation where you don't have revenues coming in, you've had to close uh, your doors, but you have, you know, your first thought is to the people, the staff you employ, and how do you protect uh, their jobs? So the job retention scheme will cover 80% of an individual's salary up to a cap of uh, 250, uh, 500 pounds uh, per month. So it's essentially protecting people's salary uh, at about 30,000 pounds a year. Uh, and government will pay 80% of that, of, um, will pay towards that. They will also cover the national insurance. So essentially the subsidy from government is equivalent to about 2,800 pounds per employee uh, per month. Um, businesses can top that up. So they can top it up, um, uh, as, you know, they can, can, you know, for some people, obviously that's below their current salary and, and um, the employer can, can choose to, to top that up if they can afford to do so. But the idea is to give people a safety net um, to apply for it, you have to go onto HMRC's website. That uh, portal opened up from uh, Monday. You, the employees have to have been on, um, they actually shifted the date, but it was on the 28th of February. They had to be on your payroll. They have moved that uh, into the middle of March because there were some people who just started uh, in, in March who have had, who've lost their jobs so they did shift that uh, a bit but essentially it worked they have to be people who are on your payroll you apply through hmrc um, and so far it has been hugely successful if you can uh, call success i mean it is in terms of protecting people's jobs of course we would rather we didn't have to have this sort of policy um, uh, and i think so that's been hugely hugely important and already there's been over two million jobs um, that that system uh, has protected it's in place over it will cover salaries over the, the months of march april may and now june of course a big question is how that changes as we come out of this uh, crisis but i think you know it what will matter is how many jobs are sort of protected through this crisis um because we know that when people become unemployed um you know there's obviously it's the household who depend on that income um, but we only have to look to the past to know that when you see high unemployment uh, across an economy or certainly in, in regions, it can be quite devastating. It's obviously harder for young people coming into the labour market at the moment. The, you know, the, the third big factor about which determines this recovery, of course, is how many businesses themselves are, are saved. That job retention scheme is absolutely focused on um, supporting employ employers to support jobs but a lot of businesses have been talking to us about the fact that you know they still have many ongoing costs you you know you may have rent that you have to pay um, in some outcome there's business rates we can maybe come on to cover that in questions um, you know there are utility bills there are so many fixed costs that businesses face um, uh, and what, of course, we're finding is it's not just, um, you know, the non-essential retailers, the hotels, the leisure um, centers that have had to close their doors. A lot of manufacturers uh, have also had to close their doors. And of course, there's the whole supply chain, everyone who feeds into that. Um, so we find that eight out of 10 businesses are seriously, uh, have seen their cash flow seriously impacted. 
And that's why the government have, have along with the Bank of England, have uh, rolled out a series um, of ways in which it's easy for businesses to get loans because we hope this will be temporary. We hope, we, I don't think we'll return exactly to a normal, you know, the old normal, but we should at some stage return to a new normal. So as the Bank of England describes it, they want to build a bridge from where we are now to the other side of this crisis and to bring as many businesses across that bridge as possible. So if you're um, a, a small business, you can, uh, you can apply for a business interruption loan scheme. It's interest free for 12 months. Um, and you can borrow up to six years. We'll, I'll come on. We're also asked for some of that to be uh, extended potentially for longer than that to lower the repayments. But essentially, you can get an interest free loan uh, if your turnover uh, is under 45 million pounds. Uh, you can get a loan of up to 5 million. Um, uh, and you apply for that through, through normally just through your ordinary bank. It's it's backed by the British Business Bank. The government have put an 80% guarantee against that loan to make it easy uh, for banks to lend. Um, uh, and most of the high street banks and also some of the uh, newer banks have been are approved lenders. There's over 35 approved uh, lenders. Um, and one of the things we've been really focused on with the Treasury um, and with the banks and with an organization called UK Finance, who represent a lot of the banks, is just making sure that that system is working and that as many loans as possible get out the door. Um, and I think what we're finding now, it's about sort of week, I think it's week three of that loan scheme, is it's generally starting now to work well uh, for businesses who are looking for loans over 25,000 and above. But it's still quite challenging for very small businesses to get the loans they need because normally these are businesses that aren't used to getting out bank loans. They tend to just borrow from family and friends. Um, so that's why you've seen a lot of calls recently to just make the system at the very low end a lot more automatic. So that's something we're working on. Uh, the, the system goes right up for, for larger business, investment grade companies. You can issue commercial paper, which the Bank of England will buy. That's something called the CCFF, happy to talk, um, to answer any questions on that. And actually one of the things we push very hard for is to have a scheme for larger businesses, uh, what we call the stranded middle. So if you have a turnover over 45 million, but you're not investment grade. Um, and as of Monday, the treasury uh, announced a scheme for those businesses where again, there's an 80% uh, government guarantee. The interest terms are a little bit different than they are for smaller businesses. Um, but the idea is we now have that full system. The final area of government support that I'll just talk a little bit about and then let's open up uh, to questions is some of the grants that are available. So if you're in retail, hospitality or leisure um, and you have a, biz a premise, like a business, uh, a property, a shop, um, then you are eligible for a grant from your local authority. It's related to your business rates. That's uh, essentially the rent or the rateable value um, for tax purposes for your premise. Um, if you're, if you're, you know, most small businesses don't actually even pay business rates, which is why this is a bit confusing for a lot of people um, because you are eligible for small business rates relief. So it's this weird thing where you're getting a grant for a tax that you don't actually pay. Um, but it's a way that the government have of identifying small businesses who have a a retail shop, our high street shops who've had to shut, and they're giving a direct grant of £10,000 for the very smallest, £25,000 um, for the larger. One of the points that we've actually called for yesterday for the, gov uh, for the government to look at is those grants are focused only at the moment on retail, hospitality and leisure, but of course there are so many businesses that fall outside of those sectors uh, who have, are facing serious challenges where a loan may not be enough to get through this crisis. So we're asking the government to extend that scheme of, of grants. Um, so, you know, we'll watch that space to see whether there is more uh, support available. Um, look, that's probably far uh, more than enough for me to sort of kick off the conversation. Um, really interested in any questions you may have um, and any comments about the challenges that, that you're experiencing.
Thank you so much, Rain. This is really, really helpful. And um, we don't yet have any questions coming in from the public, but we have some questions from, from us. Um, uh, my question to you is like, okay, we now have this kind of short-term outlook up to June uh, mm -hmm. from businesses in terms of starting this, regaining this sense of normality. Yeah. Um, the government have uh, started to issue some ideas of how to get out of, of uh, lockdown, but for businesses that are not, uh, you know, public facing, like we know, like a retailer and so on, what are your uh, your suggestions uh, for like office workers and also you know um, fashion companies, hotels? Yeah. What what are what are the things that you are currently discussing into how to do this safely? Yeah, so it's a, it's a really big focus, um, you know, both of government, the conversations we're having uh, with business, and actually we're having. Um, we're hosting a, a conversation uh, today alongside the, the TUC, so Francis O'Grady um, at the Trade Union Congress. So, because as, as you can imagine, as we try to open up uh, the economy, what's really important, and this is, I would say, for any business, is you know talk to your employees, make a risk assessment, look at what what the nature of your business is. But I think, you know, for this to work well, it absolutely has to be about you know a joint effort between businesses their employers to to think about how you open up um safely um uh, and some countries have taken quite a prescriptive approach so they've sort of said okay if you're in this sector um you know you can open up if you're in this sector you can't i think for the moment the uk are are less prescriptive so there are obviously there are some uh businesses in terms of shops, you know, non-essential retail. Um, uh, so this is where it's a bit tricky. So retailers, non-essential retailers can actually stay open as long as you can uh, follow social distancing. Um, but one of the challenges is that in, we as individuals at the moment have been told that we can't, um, we can't go in any non-essential travel. Um, so there are, and, and this is where we're having the conversations with government about how we can sort of join up some of those recommendations and, and thinking. And it probably helps if I sort of illustrate it by, you know, some different um, examples. So one of the areas like is, is around construction. You can imagine the summer months and, and particularly when we have weather like this, it's such an important time for the construction sector. And so many of that are, you know, are, are vital, transport links that that we will sort of need over the over the future so what a lot of the construction companies are looking at is how can i open how can i open up safely so that means making sure that when employees are at work that they're um keeping you know two meters apart uh, or where they do need to be closer closer than that what protective equipment do they need to be able to do those jobs um and one of the things that uh, businesses are really conscious about is you don't want to be be taking away personal pr protection equipment uh, from the NHS and in fact a lot of our members and if any of you are interested in the efforts to try and either make sure uh, there's a challenge around ventilators there's a challenge around uh, PPE equipment and we're helping to galvanize a lot of businesses together to to make PPE equipment uh, for our NHS um, workers and that's the absolute priority but as we open up we'll need some of um some of that equipment at a lower quality like we don't need the same standard as if you're in uh, the care industry and so that's something that businesses are looking at they don't want to be competing with the nhs for the the high quality equipment but there are other materials that are out there um, that businesses can put in place so that's something the construction industry are absolutely looking at um, you know, and across a lot of businesses, it's also, you know, if you ha are in co-working spaces and, of course, where you can work from home, that's, you know, that's great. But but for a lot of people, it isn't so easy to work from home or maybe their home circumstances make that more challenging. So thinking about how maybe within your organization, you can have a team A and a team B so you can open up your premises, um, but you have fewer people working so that they can have the social distance between themselves. Uh, and obviously importantly between the customers, um, uh, but then you bring in a, another team on other days. So certainly a lot of things 
uh, that companies are thinking about. Thank you. Um, we've got a question from Ben saying that um, he's got a small company. It's basically uh, himself. He's the director. Um, yeah. The question is, can he follow, uh, follow himself? Um, and he normally takes dividends. So is any assistance uh, available to him? So it is, it is a bit complicated. You can furlough yourself. Um, so if you're a director of a company, yes, you can absolutely furlough yourself. The only thing is obviously if you have, um, so when you are furloughed, you cannot work. So that's an important thing. You cannot work for your current employer. So if you're a director, you cannot work for yourself. <laughs> Strange. Um, uh, you can work for another company, uh, so they, and you can also volunteer. So important to, to say that. And if you're a director, you do have to, um, you can work to do your fiduciary duties. So obviously filing accounts, things uh, like that, you have to do as um, your duties as a director. Um, the challenge around individuals who pay, di pay themselves dividends is a bit challenging because it's a bit of an anomaly. They do have support for the self-employed, um, but I am not sure, you can furlough yourself, but it is more challenging if you've generally been paying yourself through, through dividends. Thank you. Um, uh, Janice says, you mentioned assistance available for small businesses applying to the loan schemes. Yeah. Uh, uh, help with the submission, mm -hmm. application, completion. Is there any websites, organizations, especially with uh, building a business yeah. plan on the future of the future uh, with the uncertain markets? Is there any one-stop shop that people can um, inform themselves? Um, so I think the first port of call is, I would say, is to talk to your bank. It's easy. The easiest way to apply is to use your existing bank because they have, um, and I know not everyone has like a business uh, account, um, but I think we, if you do have a business account, like a transactional account with your um, a, a current bank, then it's best to talk to them in, in the first instance because they will have a relationship manager. They know you, they know you as a business, they know uh, essentially what your cash flow is. So I always think that's easier to do it. And if there's any issues with that, you can of course go to other banks, but. Um, our advice is it's sort of easiest to start with your existing bank. Um, if you go on to uh, UK Finance, um, have they're, they're the body that represents essentially all the, ba all the banks. Um, they have some additional information uh, on their website. But I think, you know, and I'm not a financial advisor, I must uh, say that. But I think if you're, you know, obviously one of the challenges, it's challenging for the bank and it's challenging for businesses to try and say what will my cash flow be um i think you just have to make you know some basic assumptions i mean you know you can assume for the rest of this quarter that you know it's probably not going to be very different um to where you've been so far i think after that though i i would say we're in the we're in the game of making sort of rules of thumb i think maybe you assume you're closed for q2 but that it opens up over q q3 and q4 because this is something we've been sort of going back um, to the banks is, is that, um, you know, trying to do proper viability assessments right now is virtually impossible. I mean, uh, some of the examples we've had is, you know, a swimwear company who obviously make most of their uh, revenue for the year, um, uh, you know, around about now, people don't really, uh, you know, buy many swimsuits in the autumn. Um, and of course the challenge is, um, you know, they're sort of saying if we take out a loan and then have to start repaying it back, um, you know, in Q1 next year, um, we don't know what that world is going to look like, how, you know, and they're finding it. Um, but I think our sense is now that the guidance to banks is to be as sort of uh, generous as possible in making these viability assessments. Um, and actually the approval rate, I think, for most of the loans above 25 a uh, thousand has been very good but the other thing i would say is if you are having issues you know we um if it's helpful we have a um a, a, an email address coronavirus support at cbi.org.uk we're asking any business who are having issues or concerns uh, to send that to that inbox we can't always get back to everyone's question but we do get back we basically group the questions um and, and try to get back uh, to people and then it's also a way of us understanding where the problems are and what's not working 
uh, and we can help to fix them either with uh, either by talking to government or also with the financial services providers. Thank you. And the last question uh, is like, what resources would you recommend for employers to watch, read, to prepare for different, uh, from a different world post uh, uh, COVID-19? And that's from Amy. So what was that? Just how, how can in... What resources would you recommend for uh, employers to read yeah. or to watch, to prepare for the, the world that is coming? Yeah, to it? well, it's, it's tricky. I mean, one thing I would say is, look, there's, there's loads. One of the good things is there's loads of webinars. I think, you know, we've made all, you know, like, like, like what you're doing, Diana, and I think it is so important to get this information. Lots of people are making those webinars public. Um, you know, so do, do look out for, there's some really interesting ones covering, covering a range uh, of topics. We have some on our website. I know you have some, uh, Diana, and, and I think that's a really good way uh, of staying, uh, you know, of staying informed. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, Rain, thank you so much. I'm conscious of time and your busy schedule, but thank you so much for taking the time to talk into uh, Positive Luxury today and uh, uh, we will be um, uh, putting this on our YouTube channel. Um, so please feel free to watch this or to spread the word. And again, apologies for our website being uh, down this morning. Um, we're just only humans. And uh, um, we will be back this afternoon. So over to Claudia. Thank you, Rain. Well, yes. well done. I'm sure we'll all be back soon. So. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you, much. thank you very much, Rain, for your time this morning. Um, Thanks, Claudia. Thank you. Next week, we'll have another webinar. We'll be discussing the power of wellness with three special guests. As Diana said, our website is in maintenance this morning, but please head over to our social media channels, Instagram, uh, YouTube, uh, Facebook, um, and LinkedIn to reserve your spot, and uh, please stay safe. Um, we'll share the link with you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Rain. Thank you, Claudia. All right. Thanks Bye. so much. Bye. Bye.